Welcome, everyone. I'm Gil Bash. I'm privileged to be today's moderator for this very important conversation that deals with the sustenance of humanity. We're going to be talking about uh, food, the future, and sustainability. We have two outstanding people, experts in the field who know each other well, who break bread with each other, who have shared a, a, um, a drink, um, people who admire each other's work. And I've had the privilege of, of going into their backgrounds in preparation for today. It's quite impressive. You're in for, I, I think, an a extraordinary uh, treat. But before I begin, I just want to thank our host today, Levi Shapiro. Levi Shapiro really is the um, the force behind these conversations, important conversations that deal with health innovation, that deal with the sustainability of our planet, that deal with the essence of how we can make change happen through collaboration. Levi, I want to thank you once again for pulling us together, for reaching out to outstanding speakers and for being such a great champion for innovation that can improve the human condition. I also wanna thank my colleague, Colin Brunel, who is one of the organizers of today's event. And without Colin, of course, we wouldn't be all together. So Colin, thank you as well. Sustainable agriculture practitioners seek to integrate three objectives into their work, a healthy environment, economic viability, and social and economic equality. People collaborating around our food system, our food chain, growers, food processors, distributors, retailers, consumers, and waste managers can ensure a sustainable agricultural system. Today, we have two exceptional speakers, leaders, who work tirelessly to advance the principle that we must meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Let me introduce our conversationalist for today. Starting off, we have Jason Clay. He is, as the slide states, he's the Senior Vice President of Markets and is dealing with, uh, he's the Executive Director as well of the Markets Institute for the World Wildlife Fund. He is a um, exceptional, um, advocate and policy leader based in Washington, D.C., and the World Wildlife Fund is the leading organization championing the most pressing issues at the intersection of nature, people, and climate. Jason oversees the World Wildlife Fund's efforts with private sector tech companies to improve supply chain management, particularly around ingredient sourcing and carbon and water neutrality. He understands the apparent power of collaboration and works with governments, foundations, researchers, non-governmental organizations to advance environmentally sensitive practices in agriculture and aquaculture. His goal is to create global standards for producing and using raw materials, particularly life-sustaining carbon and water. He is familiar with agriculture. He ran a family farm. He taught at Harvard and Yale. He worked in the US Department of Agriculture and has dedicated 25 years and more working with human rights and environmental organizations before joining the World Wildlife Fund 22 years ago. We also have with us today his friend and colleague, extraordinary person as well, who's unusually expansive. Before I tell you a bit about Howard's credentials for the conversation today. Let me just say that amongst his many, many um, hobbies and advocations and passions is that he collects and restores classic American, modern Japanese and Italian motorcycles. He is a 200 mile per hour club member on an unrestricted 1999 Suzuki, and I cannot pronounce the last name, but Levy who knows Japanese and Howard who owns it can. And he averaged, he clocked at uh, 201 miles, 0.386 miles per hour. I imagine, Howard, that's quite fast. Maybe if there's a moment, you'll tell us what that experience was like. And if you're still doing that, uh, I hope you wear some sort of protective helmet and gear. And it's not your magnificent beard blowing in the wind. But there's also a practical side to Howard's life. 
He is a purpose-centered entrepreneur. He is a venture capital partner. He's a scientist. He's a leader of food sustainability. He was previously chief agricultural officer at Mars Incorporated, and he's the former co-owner of Seeds of Change, which became part of Mars, I believe, and was his introduction to Mars. At Mars, he encouraged the company's commitment to sustainable sourcing of its cocoa bean supply. With expansive interest and expertise, he is a fellow, senior fellow at UC Davis, the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences, a distinguished fellow of the World Agroforestry Center, and a science advisor to the MIT Media Lab. For a decade, he served as chairperson of the Board of Agricultural Sustainability Institute at the University of California. Looking to the future, our speaker founded the African Orphan Crops Consortium and the African Plant Breeding Academy about a decade ago. These efforts will sequence, assemble, and annotate 101 essential food cultivars, the backbone of African nutrition, and train some 150 mid-career plant, plant breeders in modern technology. Again, all steps leading to a sustainable planet. Jason and Howard, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to start with Jason Clay. He's going to have a uh, presentation for us, and then we'll invite Howard to present, and then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Jason, over to you, please. Thank you, and um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, I just want to say at the beginning that if you have questions or or issues that are not addressed during our, our, our presentations or the conversation after, uh, please forward them on to the organizers and we'll be happy to get answers back to you. Uh, I also wanna put one disclaimer on this is that no one has a crystal ball to tell you about the future of food and agriculture globally. However, I think that it is fair to say that the speed of change will be greater than any of us ever thought possible or have ever seen in our lifetime. And also the disruptions will be both short and long-term. What I wanna to discuss today are really the key issues to monitor and address as we go forward that are gonna be needed to make the food system more resilient in the long-term. The Aroma of Ethiopia have a saying, you can't wake a person who's pretending to sleep. And I think we're all a bit remiss in, in terms of understanding how fundamental already climate change has been in, in reshaping our food system, but more importantly, how important it's going to be as we go forward. We can't get away from the basic uh, equation that population times consumption has got to equal the carrying capacity of the planet. And at this point in time, each year, we surpass the the uh, ability of the planet to reproduce the renewable natural and natural uh, resources that we rely on uh, somewhere in late July, early August. So we've got to start balancing that equation a little bit better. We can't just live off the principle. Uh, we've got to, to get in line with what the, the planet can produce. Our strategy to date has really been for the last 50 years or so to focus on improved efficiency, uh, of input use, water, fertilizer, et cetera, increased productivity uh, through genetics, uh, through improved livestock, grasses, et cetera, reduce waste and, and shift consumption. And these strategies have been targeted mostly around a 20% or a 30% or a 50% increase, and they're simply not fast enough. Today, we have to be looking at what is 2X or what is 5X or what is 10X or even what is 100x if we're going to get to where we need to go with the number of additional people being born plus their increased income and their shifts in consumption, we're not going to be able to meet demand using our current uh, rather linear uh, pattern of improvement. One of the key things to remember is what's sustainable today won't be tomorrow. And what we're always looking for is continuous improvement in something that is more sustainable. The issue isn't going forward what to think, it's how to think. That's what we have to keep in mind. We have to begin to think laterally. We have to look at 
at this as a kaleidoscope where all the pieces are there, but if you turn it one notch, you see a totally different pattern, a totally different picture. That's how we need to begin to think about our food system and what the opportunities are to improve it. Just this last month, we've reached peak land. Now, what that means specifically is that we are using less land for the first time ever in human history than we used in the past to produce food. But unfortunately, we're not actually, uh, we haven't stopped our encroachment on natural habitat. We're, we're still deforesting, we're still uh, converting natural habitats like uh, wetlands and, and grasslands, et cetera. Uh, and so what that means is that we're throwing less land out the back end of this by abandoning it and, and throwing it away, literally. Uh, but this is just peak land. What about peak agrochemicals? What about peak water? I mean, it would be important for us to, if there's anything that we look at, I think going forward, in addition to land, it's gonna to have to be water. How do we use water more sparingly? How do we uh, you leave more water for the rest of the living things on the planet? So sustainability is really a pre-competitive issue. We all depend on natural resources. When anyone degrades them, everyone loses. Most sustainable products cost more, but less sustainable ones actually cost the planet. And that's what we've got to, to get away from. The reputation of a sector is only as good as the poorest performer. And that's why we're beginning to see sectors like the Global Salmon Initiative start to share information. In fact, what they have found is that if they share information down to the last net pen uh, across all the companies, they can all learn faster. And so in eight years, the Global Salmon Initiative, representing more than 50% of global salmon production, was able to get more than half of the world's salmon aquaculture certified as more sustainable by working together. To date, the salmon aquaculture industry is the only industry that's done that. So how do we begin to learn more quickly? How can we, um, we're never gonna have complete science and we can't wait for it to develop. That, that's a fool's errand, it will never be complete. We need to build the plane while we fly it uh, because we have to learn faster. We can't afford thousands of corporate learning curves or millions of, of producer learning curves. Today, we have to learn from each other much more quickly. And I think we do that through knowledge sharing platforms, pay to play systems where you put your information in and you get to see what other people are doing. We don't even know how fast crops are moving across, across countries or, or in the US north into Canada. We think it's about 30 miles per year that corn and soybeans and cotton are moving north. Well, when the USDA is not tracking that, it's very hard to figure out what that means for farmers, what that means for uh, infrastructure that's in place, what that means for equipment and sales. Farmers don't know how to farm the next crop. How can they learn more quickly from their other, from their other brethren who are further south? It also means that the educational institutions aren't always set up for it. A university that is, is well positioned today to support farmers growing cotton in Texas isn't for producers growing cotton in Kansas where they are today or in Des Moines where they will be in 20 years. So these are, these are issues that we have to take much more seriously. We also need to move away from a, a discussion that's focused on practices and really focus on metrics and on results because it's, we, we need to understand what the performance is that we can live with and then move producers towards that. Common metrics are gonna be critical for this. We don't even have common LCA methodologies. The U EU is actually benchmarking and standardizing an LCA methodology for 2024. Norway has tried to do the same thing through its Transparency Act we're pushing the US to either harmonize with or simply adopt 
adopt what is coming out of Europe. But we need, in addition to just LCA methodologies, we need common boundaries. We need common databases. Right now, what we're seeing in, at WDF is that there's a lot of manipulation and a lot of gaming the system to find the least strenuous LCA to allow a company to make its estimates and its, and its, uh, its targets lower than they actually should be if we're gonna achieve the changes we need in a timely way. There is also a problem I think with most of the science-based targets for greenhouse gas emissions reduction that they're, they're based on averages and there really is a problem with averages. We've done research on 10 different commodities, beef, poultry, palm oil, coffee, corn, soy, pulp and paper, salmon, shrimp from aquaculture and tuna. And what we found is that there are three to five production systems for each. From the least intensive to the most intensive and, and in between. We found that there's a 10x difference in greenhouse gas emissions for producers within one of those systems. But between any of those three to five systems, you can have a hundred X difference in the greenhouse gas emissions. So when companies are basing their targets on average greenhouse gas emissions in their scope three emissions in supply chains, they don't know who produced the emissions. They don't know where they are. They don't know why they produced them. And they sure don't know what the incentives are that those producers need in order to change. We need that kind of granularity we need to break out at least into deciles if we're going to understand how to move the bottom. So if you give a thousand producers um, the same practice, you're gonna get close to a thousand different results. It's gonna vary on their skills, their money, their land, their scale, et cetera. So if we want results, we really need to be asking for them. We need to be setting a bar, uh, because if, if you simply ask people to comply with compliance right now, which is what a lot of companies are doing around regenerative ag, then you will get, get, get compliance. If you want to actually shift, you need to ask for a performance. Right now, what we're seeing as we look at, at the information is that the bottom 25% of producers produce about 50% of the impact, but only about 10% of the product. So globally, the best way to, to increase production and reduce impact is to focus on the bottom, not the top. And yet to date, almost all of the market-based activities have been to focus on voluntary standards, which reward the people who are already better. So we've gotten it kind of on the wrong end of the stick. We need to be looking at the bottom and how to move that as opposed to how to reward the top. So greenhouse gas emissions, everybody is, is thinking about this within the food system. Uh, some are doing more about it than others. Nobody is probably doing enough. Uh, the food system is all in, is responsible for between 25 and 35% of all emissions. It's one of the single largest uh, sources of emissions, but it's also greatly affected by greenhouse, by, by climate change. And so food more than, more than any other sector probably has a vested interest in getting it right. The biggest contributors on the food, on the food side are deforestation and conversion. That's the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. If there's soy in, in salmon, in the feed for salmon, the feed represents about 70 to 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions in that salmon when it's produced. If there's deforestation in the soy, that's in the feed for salmon, you add another 60% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's how significant deforestation is. Think of it as living coal uh, and what you're adding to the food that we eat. Ruminants are also critical for methane. Uh, they're all, the other key uh, source of emissions are pesticides, herbicides, water, fertilizers, and all of the embedded greenhouse gas emissions that are in the energy to make those. Going forward, what we need to see is an 80% absolute reduction of these emission sources. That's not relative per ton of product produced. That's an absolute 
with say a 2020 cutoff date. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna get there? In the context of climate change and food production, we're seeing more extreme weather. We're seeing sometimes 100 year or even 500 year multiple events in a decade. We're seeing a lot more chronic weather where we have drought. Uh, we're expecting drought for the, most of the 2030 decade. Uh, where are we going to be producing the food? Certainly not in the places where we are today. One of the other big issues I think about climate change and food that hasn't really been picked up on by many is that now the scientists that are analyzing this are projecting that we're gonna have a net primary productivity loss of about 10 to 15%. What that means from a food perspective is that producers are gonna to have to produce 10 to 15% more than they do today just to be treading water. And then to accommodate more people and, and, and changing consumption, they're gonna to have to produce more on top of that. As, as we go forward, we're gonna to have to do more and we're gonna to have to do it with less and we're gonna to have to do it faster than we ever have. The other, the other issue which people haven't talked about is there's not only this net primary productivity loss, but there's also, we now currently measure, maybe not as well as we should, but food loss and food waste, the post-harvest loss on fields and in infrastructure and, and food waste that is kind of post-consumer, post-retailer, et cetera. Today, I think we're, we're seeing for the first time what we could call climate loss. And climate loss is the pre-harvest losses, the food that was never planted because it was too muddy, the food that was planted three times before you got any kind of a of a uptake with 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 the seeding, and then it was it was immature when it was harvested, so the 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 production was way down. <clears throat> Our estimates, and we've been trying to work with FAO data to document in this and with insurance uh, data out of the U.S. But our estimate is that we already have a post -har uh, a pre-harvest loss, this climate loss, that's more or less around 10%. How do we accommodate that in terms of planning for the food needs of the future? Uh, it, it just puts more and more pressure on those areas that can produce food. So why do we want to reduce emissions? <clears throat> One is that the modeling suggests that the climate impacts that have already been set in motion, even if we did everything perfectly from today forward, would still be felt until 2500. Now, some Native American groups used to plan in terms of seven generations. This is more on the order of 21 generations. It's not just our kids and grandchildren that are going to be affected by what happens now. It's for the next 300 years, how do we, how do we address those kinds of, of long-term changes? Certainly not by sitting on our hands. We've got to begin to make the investments. But here are some of the other impacts that, are, that have been uh, modeled and, and suggested. One to 1.5 billion people will be displaced by 2050. <clears throat> That's about one in eight people uh, or even one in six we're already at more than 150 million people displaced because of climate change. And, and climate change isn't just about the climate, but it's about the knock-on impacts and resource wars and conflicts that are gonna happen because of that, whether it's water or food or land. We're also, as I mentioned, gonna see that global decline in net primary productivity. So these are our, our issues, thawing of the permafrost, melting of glaciers and ice packs, we're gonna see ocean level rises. All of these will be happening between now and 2050, uh, where we're gonna see major changes, even changes in the movement of currents that have kept Europe warmer than it would be otherwise. And if Europe goes into a, a cold spell, it's going to have a huge impact, not just on the European diet and consumption, but on the rest of the world as well. There's never gonna be enough money to cover the transitions. So how do we pivot today's subsidies, which support a food system which is not resilient and not uh, providing what we need in the future 
how do we pivot that food system using today's subsidies to the system that is more resilient? How can we take advantage of stranded assets? And here are, here are some in, in an urban area where we have a thermal power plant that, that produces in addition to uh, energy, it also produces heat and water, which can be used for vertical ag. Uh, we could build vertical ag programs adjacent to this <coughs> in, in the middle of cities where you can actually employ other stranded assets, which are people that are unemployed largely in many of these areas, give them opportunities that they haven't had before, produce food locally that has two to three weeks longer shelf life that reduces food waste and reduces energy cost and transport transportation, and actually where, depending on how we finance these structures, the workers can actually have profit sharing or some type of employee co-ownership uh, so that we can address multiple issues at the same time. We need new business models. How do we build resilience into the way we run business? How do we use markets to change markets? One is through long-term contracts. Uh, another is, that we're exploring in Brazil is the use of dedicated commodity funds where a per ton fee of product or a per hide uh, uh, fee per, per leather or beef goes into a fund where 100% of it goes to producers to finance their transition to become legal deforestation free and more sustainable. And that this funding would go on as the transition happens uh, because these it's not a one and done thing. These producers are gonna have to become uh, much better over time. We can bundle the purchases and offtake agreements so there's larger volumes created so that we could even bring in green funds and bonds to help finance this on 30 and 40 year uh, investments with lower interest rates. We need to explore profit sharing and ESOPs and other forms of, of ownership that, that actually address some of the uh, people on the bottom, if you will. One of the issues that's rarely talked about in our discussions about resilience and food and food security and, and a more sustainable food system going forward is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I would, I would say that it's probably the case that the most inequitable institution on the planet are global supply chains, where producers and those who work for them have the most stunting the most malnutrition and the highest levels of poverty of any populations on the planet. Uh, that's got to be addressed. We often talk about externalities that are left out of pricing and food. Uh, environment is, is generally the one that people think about, but I think people uh, are also externalities uh, in this current system. And we need to figure out how to reinvent uh, supply chains so that uh, we don't have, we don't have stunning, we don't have children that, that are, are hungry when their parents are producing food for global markets. We need to find new markets. Uh, dairy cows like these can produce milk, but they can also produce uh, electricity and renewable natural gas. That can then be, be run through biogas digesters to capture liquid ammonia and NP and K from the substrates. Uh, so that these animals are actually processing plants for much more than just the milk. Uh, we can also incorporate the milk purchase into all this land in the background, which has got forests that are sequestering carbon, that are protecting watersheds, that are making uh, downstream flow more continuous throughout the year, and that are making water uh, better quality because of, the, of these forests. Farmers are not currently paid for those things today. Every, the money that they make is based entirely on milk, and that's a very, a very uh, weak system, and it's, it's not necessary. There are other uh, valuable things that, that dairy farms can be doing uh, in, in markets. One of the real questions, I think, that we have today is whether the, the, we're at the end of the global commodity system. Uh, Commodities have had an incredible century and a half run uh, where they have, traders have, have shown that they can be extremely efficient and very uh, able to deliver just in time that they can move uh, commodities around the world 
in a very timely way and have have them in place. And when a, one trader doesn't have it, they in, they buy from others to fill contracts. But what we need today from commodities is more than this. This this is important. We don't want to lose this efficiency, but we also need transparency and traceability. Today, we need to know where a product was produced and how it was produced. We need this both for raw, raw materials, but also uh, for finished products. It's not just a want to know issue. Buyers, I think, have the right to know uh, if slave or, or child or bonded labor was used in the production of, of the raw materials. They also have the right to know if there was deforestation and habitat conversion. And increasingly, they're liable for this. If you're an, an executive in a company that touches product that was produced by slave or bonded labor in the US now, you can go to jail. That's including in the port facility. That's including in the trucking company that hauled it. That's including even the NGO that might have taken money from that company to work with them on supply chains. Everybody is liable for that. The same is now beginning to be true for deforestation and habitat conversion. Right now, the largest trader in the world is selling soy from Brazil and, and the soy that 4% of their soy has deforestation linked to it. They're making $18 million a year just selling that soy out of Brazil. But the people who buy that soy have liabilities of $44 million because of the embedded carbon that's in that soy even if you took just a $10 a ton value for, for that carbon. These are the kinds of issues that have to be fixed with our trading system as we go forward. We've got to account for and pay for these, these types of impacts. So there's been a question or a, a sense for a long time that, that some companies are too big to fail and that they will be bailed out as GM was bailed out in, in uh, recently in the US. Some other companies, financial institutions weren't actually bailed out, but generally the sense is that these are just too important to let fail. Uh, I think going forward, we have to ask if that's really the case or not. Are the, these companies that are too big, are they just too big to change? And what we're finding is that the biggest companies in most sectors, whether they're traders or brands or retailers, have the least incentive, incentive to change and are often the most uh, rigid about changing. So we have to be, they're too big to change um, is, is a real question. Are they just gonna die? So if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Uh, I think we need to start taking these issues a lot more interest, a lot more to heart and start answering some of these questions. Think about it, thank you. Thank you, Jason, thank you very much for that. And, um, you know, I, I, I know that Levy is sharing your presentation with others on this call and it's on the website. We'll make sure it's, it's shared even further. You, you, you raise, as you said earlier, important topics that may not be resolved in the course of our conversation today, but need to be discussed and explored fully. And you've done that I, with, with, with a great deal of, I think, specificity. Thank you for that. We're now going to turn to Howard and, um, and uh, Howard and Jason work together frequently in combined projects. Let's go over to you, Howard, and then we'll have time for, for Q&A. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for this opportunity to, to present with one of my uh, dear colleagues, Jason Clay, who's been so key in, in raising these issues fundamentally for all of us to understand and respond to. So I do believe the speed of change is faster than our response. Next slide, please. And it has to do with this term wicked. And, and wicked is a, a complicated term used to describe some of the most challenging and complete and complex issues of our time, many of which threaten human health. So when we think about big, systematic, far-reaching, global, interdependent, nonlinear, economic, environmental, social, structural, personal, shared, and human, and you realize that no one can escape uh, from anything, it all is impacted by this complex word called wicked. Next slide, please. So the speed of change is faster than our response. 
And, and why do I refer to this? Well, if I look at what has happened and what our, many of our intentionality is, whether it's from things like COP26 or the UN uh, Global uh, General Assembly meeting or all the things associated with that, I wonder if someone is sleeping or is someone actually not paying attention to what's going on all around us? It would be impossible to miss the fact that there has been just this incredible drought this year in the Great West, or hurricanes in Florida, or fires around the world. So the speed of change, what we're doing to ourselves, is really very complicated. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about the convergence. I like computing. I like analysis. I like genetics. I'm a gene jockey at heart. I've been a plant scientist for as long as I can remember. I, I worked on a family farm from age five onward, some on Long Island outside of New York City and some near Syracuse. But I've been involved with farming and what it means to produce things and understanding the systematics about it. But I've also lived long enough to see what computing analytics or analysis and genetics can do for us. Next slide, please. So imagine that in 1970, we had a, a, a chip that had only around a thousand transistors on the chip. And then we look at 2019 and Cerebus, and they have a chip that has 1.2 trillion transistors on the chip. I mean, we're not talking about a quantum leap, we're talking about something that actually is almost inconceivable that we've been able to do this work. At the same time, we have ignored deforestation as Jason so, you know, so eloquently pointed out. We have not talked about eutrophication in this time period when we've had all this technology move forward. So how do we pull this all together? Next slide, please. And we can analyze biological systems in a way that we never could do it before. So when I started, this didn't even exist in the 60s. And now today, this only goes up to 2015, 2016, it's even faster now. What we can see through mass spec versus what we can see just literally 20 years ago is more than a quantum leap. So the ability to analyze things that we never could see or understand before is now been put in our hands so that there is no excuse for not knowing something about the molecular level. Next slide, please. And then of course, genetic technologies. When I began as a young scientist, the sequencers were the size of a uh, large school bus, and we use punch cards. And today, if you can see this, there is a little sequencer that's the size of a, a couple pens in your pocket. And you can sequence almost equally from a machine like this than you can with anything else. Next slide, please. So I have heroines, and I have heroes, and I have humankind that I've been dealing with for a long time. So I'd like to talk about a few heroines and heroes and what they mean to humanity. Next slide, please. So I was fortunate to have time with Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize. And I love the fact that she said, I never thought of stopping. I just hated sleeping. I can't imagine having a better life. Next slide, please. What Barbara McClintock worked for her entire life was something that she wanted to understand. Are things inherited genetically? Are they just random? Can we help it happen? Can we impose ourselves on the systems? So she in invented or discovered or analyzed, whatever term you want to use, what became known as jumping genes. And for those of you who took any kind of biology in high school or college, you know these are called transposons. And she used simple corn 
And it, in it, she understood that transposable elements move from one site to another in a cell's DNA. And this became phenomenally important. Next slide, please. And when one thinks about teosinte on the left of your screen and teosinte hybrid in the center of your screen and modern maze on the right-hand side of your screen, Imagine what it took to go from left to right. Jason showed some images of how we move left to right to improve things. But imagine the human intervention or the natural occurrence that caused Teosinte to morph with just a little human health into something called modern corn. This is extraordinary. This is over 7,000 years. Maybe 10,000 years this took place. And now we think that we have to solve a problem, and can we solve a problem in months or years versus centuries? Next slide, please. So in 2018, I observed something in a small community called the Tontopec de Morelios in the Mije region of Oaxaca, Mexico. It was maize that grew 16, 18 feet tall, and it had no external fertilization put on it. But in 1980, when I observed this for the first time, I didn't have any analytical tools. There was no transcriptomics. There was no proteomics. There was no genomics. There was no omics at all. No one had even had the tools invented. But by 2018, working with an uncommon collaboration of people, we were able to prove that something called nitrogen fixation is possible in maize, the holy grail. They've been thinking about this for a hundred years. The nitrogen that's applied to the fields as uh, Jason spoke about causes harm to the water system. It causes eutrophification. One only has to look in the Gulf of Mexico outside the zone of the Mississippi River when it flows. And there's a dead zone called largely by nitrogen. The nitrogen is applied to fields. Some of it blows away, some of it washes away, and only about 30% actually hits its target. So to have a crop like maize, which is one of the heaviest nitrogen users in the world, make its own nitrogen mechanistically assuming nitrogen from the atmosphere, processing in a very interesting system that was first described in this paper in 2018, is a breakthrough. But it took 38 years. And now we could probably do this in four years because the tools are so available to us. Next slide, please. And this is what we found out. Field experiments using N15 natural abundance or N15 natural enrichments over five years indicated that there was nitrogen fixation, which contributed to between 29 and 82 percent of the nutrients needed to grow this maize 16 to 18 feet tall. All of a sudden, we realized what if we could get this into modern maize, the maize that you see all across America or in other parts of the world? So this was a, a observation that became a discovery and now is in translation before it can be scaled up on a massive scale. It's, it's a very complicated system. The image you see of the red aerial roots, sometimes called advantageous roots, surrounded by a mucilaginous material. That material is an oxygen starved environment where you have diisotropic bacteria living in it that can take that nitrogen that is atmospheric that penetrates this gel and go through a system called nitrogenase and actually auto-dose ammonia to the roots of the plant. It's almost like magic. It's almost like hard to believe this is true, but it is true. And now we're working on getting this into modern maize varieties. Next slide, please. Gerd of Kush, a phenomenal individual, 
He said, human hunger and desires are elastic, but lot, land is non-elastic. Population growth continues to outsmart food production. Agriculture scientists and geneticists need to work over time to meet the ever-growing human need for food and to alleviate hunger and poverty. He's a rice breeder. I was fortunate in my life that his office was next to mine at UC Davis. So we spoke to each other on a regular basis. Next slide, please. And this is what Gerd of Kush won all of his accolades for. In 1985, he developed IR64 rice, high yielding what we call mega variety. And if you say, well, that can't be so hard. Look at the complexity of this diagram, starting at the top with all the parent lines and all the crosses that were made, ending up with IR64 at the bottom of that diagram. It's phenomenal that one individual had the wisdom, insights, observations, and tenacity to breed this rice, which is eaten by more people in the world than any other grain. Now, rice suffers a similar malaise to maize. It takes a lot of nitrogen to grow. It grows in water. Sometimes it's flooded, sometimes it's dry land. But that nitrogen also has negative implications. So what if rice can make its own nitrogen? Number two of the top five crops in the world. Next slide, please. So all of a sudden, this woman, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier invented something called CRISPR. She said it gives us power to control genetic species future. And it's awesome and it's terrifying. She's a buddy of mine. I went to her virtual award ceremony. But what this portrays is the fact that we have a new way of working, a technology called CRISPR. And CRISPR is democratized. You can do CRISPR in your garage. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could do it. The, the ability to do that work is possible for all of us. Next slide, please. And this is what it takes. You have something called Gaia. Uh, RNA, you have a place where you want to make a change. You have something like little scissors. You make it, you put it back together, and you have a solution to a problem. Next slide, please. So then I thought, okay, we'll work on rice. I worked on maize, big breakthrough, 2018. I don't want to ever be bored. So working with a, a wonderful colleague, Eduardo Bloomwald, in his lab, we developed genetic modification of flavobiosynthesis in rice, which enhances biological nitrogen fixation. The second way that I have been able to work on nitrogen fixation. Next slide. And this is Eduardo in our greenhouse. And you can see in the pictures, the Kentucky rice is a classic Japanese rice. CRISPR 85, 87, and 104 are our rices. And you can see the difference in the plant and in the yield. So by using this CRISPR technology, we were able to supplant or eradicate the nitrogen application, have higher yields, smaller plants, less energy in the plant, more into the seed. Next slide, please. But the real problem, as Jason alluded to, is hunger plus malnutrition equals stunting. And when people think about stunting, they think normally from an anthropological mentality, which a child is small of height and low weight. What they don't talk about is this thing called neural tube development, that the children don't have neural tube development. So the children will never be Barbara McClintock or Barbara, I mean, Barbara McClintock or Jennifer Doudner. They won't be Gerd of Kush. They won't be any of us because they wouldn't have had the proper nutrition, not food, not just calories, not just carbohydrates, but the appropriate food to give them having full neural tube and other parts of their body's development. 
Next slide, please. And this is gigantic. 37% of the children under five in, Indi in uh, Africa are stunted. 47% in India rurally are stunted. And 5% in the United States. These are the best statistics we have. Next slide, please. And look at it worldwide. 40 or more percent of the population will never develop like any of us on this call today. Next slide, please. So in Africa, one of every five people is hungry. 59 million are affected by stunting, 13.8 million by wasting, 9.7 are overweight, and 38% of the women of reproductive age have anemia. It's all about nutrition. This is not about caloric density. This is not about shipping boatloads of stuff over that doesn't have high nutritional value. Next slide, please. So what do we need to do? We need to produce plants that are bred for nutritional value, high yielding, resilient to climate change, resistant to pest disease, and are water and nutrient use efficient. Next slide, please. So with some help from guys like Jason Clay and a group of other people, I formed, I founded, whatever the term is, the African Orphan Crops Consortium and the African Plant Breeding Academy. We created it to solve stunting in Africa. Pretty audacious. How do you do it? Next slide, please. Well, you, put, you find someone who can represent you at the African Union. You go to the African Union's President's Council, you make your case, and then you form what I call uncommon collaborations. Next slide, please. You gotta train people to do the work. So we form these collaborations that are uncommon. In 2014, we started a plant breeding academy. We brought together mid-career plant breeders by application and selection from 37 countries, 155 to date we have trained, free, no cost. We built a network. We have over 685 breeding programs going on today. 685 where there weren't before on 101 food crops. And we've established grant funds to help them do this work. All without government uh, grants, all without big donor grants, all because we knew this had to be done. Next slide, please. And this is what an uncommon collaboration looks like. These are people who normally don't collaborate with each other including all the big tech companies like Thermo Fisher, like Illumina, you know, their competitors, Corteva, Cyverse, Keygene. And then you see funny people like BGI, World Agroforestry, NEPAD, Mars, UC Davis, World Food Program, WWF because of Jason. And everyone agreed that we would reach consensus on the issue, which is ending chronic hunger and malnutrition and stunting in Africa. Next, please. So I've been fortunate to live long enough to see things like this happen as well. Alpha Fold. Many people think it's the most important achievement in AI ever in history. And this is Demis who leads it. And what did they do? Next slide, please. They developed a system that predicts a protein's 3D structure. <laughs> and basically what, it, what they did was they predicted all proteins in history. People won the Nobel Prize for one protein. This is all the proteins ever. They've been able to give us, hand us as a gift to humanity. So we know how it works. It's going to release over a hundred million proteins. I know people who worked on two proteins their entire academic career. This is the game changer. Just like sequencing is a game changer. So what does this all mean? Next slide. So we have a convergence of technology, computing, analytics, genetics, artificial intelligence and machine learning, which my belief is will answer many of the questions that that Jason raised. It's not gonna grow a tree, you gotta plant the tree. It's not gonna grow the maize to feed 
the chickens and the cows and the pigs. It's not going to solve the, the water problem that we have caused by climate change. But what this does, it gives plant breeders, animal breeders, anything that we need now is at our fingertips. So we can't say it's, I don't have the capacity any longer. Now we can only say they don't have the will to solve the problems. Thank you. Howard, thank you very much for that. We, we only have a few minutes and, and this, this conversation really um, in, in hindsight should really be much, much longer. Um, first, I wanna thank you and, and Jason uh, really for, for providing us with, I think, a authoritative summary. I'm, I'm just gonna ask one question. Hopefully we'll have enough time to engage. We have two minutes left for this conversation. I'm going to invite, if, if Howard, you and Jason would agree, and Levy, Sh Levy Shapiro is willing to organize another conversation dedicated to this sort of a follow-on conversation. It is so important that people have an opportunity to speak with you that I don't want to shortchange them for the long term. So Levy, if you're in agreement to an upcoming second session with Jason and Howard, I think it would be very appreciated, certainly by me. I want to ask you both um, one pressing question before we wrap up today. I'll start with Jason and Howard pivot over to you. Um, Jason, you'd said something. Uh, I'm gonna summarize it. Um, and I'm gonna ask you, uh, you're both passionate about this. It's clearly you work together shoulder to shoulder. You're, you're mobilizing organizations, you're mobilizing capital. The, the biggest question we often have, I hear from young people, um, and I, I wanna leave them with hopefully an encouraging message. Can we work fast enough to address some of these, these um, perilous questions. Is, is it possible? Bill Gates says we have about 35 years before we reach that sort of critical point of no return. Do you think that we can um, sort of extend that timeline? Do you think that major corporations realize that the clock is ticking? Jason, over to you first. So I think, I think the question is not whether we can, but whether we can soon enough. And I, I, I don't think the largest companies are actually going to be the ones leading this. I think that they're, the, they're going to be the drags on the system. That's what I was using the dinosaur, the dinosaur analogy. To, so you can you can take your Cargills and Walmarts and, and Nestle's and they're not likely going to be the ones that come up with a change. So here, here is where we need a thousand flowers blooming. We need a lot of smaller startups that are beginning to work together, but sharing their data so that they can all learn faster because everybody depends on getting this right sooner rather than later. So that, that would be my hope. I don't see government having any ability to move as quickly as, as we need things to move now. Uh, hopefully they can pick up on some things later and start subsidizing some things or, or pivoting funding towards things. But right now it's gonna be left to innovators and the small startups that they start with. I'm, I don't wanna summarize your comments, but uh... I'll just say, based on this, while you're encouraging, it sounds like you're also worried, very worried. Yeah, I mean, I have children, I have grandchildren. Um, and, and if this is a, a, <laughs> a 21 generation time frame, you know, then hopefully I will have in those generations as well. So this is a problem we need to fix, not just for people, but for every living thing on the planet. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Howard, I'm going to ask you the same question. You're, you're a person who has um, been very comfortable sort of exploring beyond the nine dots, whether it's speed, whether it's venture capital, whether it's creating purpose-driven enterprises, it's your new venture capital group. Um, Jason has mapped out a call to action, entrepreneurism, new technologies, new ideas that make it possible for us to engage the challenge. Do you think you and your colleagues, based on your knowledge, CRISPR, other technologies can make the clock work to our advantage? Well, there's, there's two parts to the answers. One, who is going to do the work? And do we have the capacity everywhere where we need it? And that's why we started the African Front Crops Consortium to change, trade people and just, you know, using marker assisted selection to, to renew it. That's why we were opening in January, the CRISPR Academy in Africa 
to work with those scientists coming from countries that have that ability. Do I think it's possible? So I think it has to do with will. Do, do we really want to change this? Do we have a notion of healing the planet? Uh, do we really want to have this happen in our time frame, or are we passing it on? And you know, I'll soon be an octogenarian, so that there is only so much time left in my life. But as I look down those age groups, what what is going to be the motivation for them to care uh, when they look at their parents and their grandparents who seemingly don't care because they took us to this spot, or I've taken us to this spot. So I believe everything that we need to do to solve the problems is there. And I agree with Jason, it's not going to be large corporations because they went from greenwashing to green wishing after COP27 in Glasgow last year. So if you wish something is gonna happen, that's really not a very proactive methodology of scientific discovery. There will be entrepreneurs everywhere in the world that are operating now and will operate in the future. All they need is the smallest amount of encouragement. Sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's intellectual, sometimes it's management. We have to give that to them as fast as we possibly can. And you can't just depend on foundations. Foundations are driven by their founders' mentality. Whether it was Rockefeller, whether it was this foundation or that foundation, and you can't turn to them because they have an idea what they should do because that's what their founder said to do. Yeah, so it's, so it's, it's, it's a disparate group of people who normally don't get together. That's why I like the term uncommon collaborations. I mean, Jason and I, when we started, we were like the odd couple, you know, it just it's from this view and this view, but we understood and respected what each one does. And with doing that at a global level is the only way to really solve this problem. I think you've, you've nailed it. I, I think that often with some of the biggest challenges of the world today, we don't lack capital. We don't lack innovation. We lack will. Uh, we lack a pathway of collaboration. And I think that most of the world's or most of life's biggest challenges are often resolved by people putting aside their business cards their business addresses, their flags, and so forth, and recognizing we share a common future. Howard, Jason, Levy, Cullen, I want to thank you so much for bringing us together. I urge us to reconvene again soon in conversation where we can have extended Q&A with our audience. In the meantime, please know that this video will go live it's in, in its entirety as quickly as possible. This has been an important conversation. I hope that the people listening take this to heart and begin to push forward. On my part, I also want to make a commitment that if people wish to consult with me from a communications or positioning standpoint, I'm here to help and listen. This is not a business offer. This is an offer as a member of this human society we call planet Earth. I'm here to help as well. So Levy, I'm going to turn this back to you. I thank you so much for bringing us together today. Very, very grateful to our speakers for sharing their valuable time and expertise for uh, Gil uh, and excellent moderation, as well as Cullen Burnell for uh, doing all the work behind the curtain. All of this will be posted to LinkedIn and um, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody.